Welcome to 33 Founders, a series about founders of the coolest startups. Brought to you by 33 Voices and hosted by Chase Jennings and Jenna Abdul. So Yavli's mission is to help people make great product purchase decisions. And the way we do that is you start by describing your specific situation, what products you're looking for, why you need them. And then other people are matched based on their interests and often if they've recently made a similar purchase and connected with you so that you can have an actual dialogue with them, a real conversation about your decision. So a lot of people call us a social consumer reports or a Quora for shopping. Um, you know, we like to think of ourselves as trying to recreate that experience where, you know, you run into an old friend at a cafe uh, and they say, what's going on? You're like, oh, I'm actually in the market for a new car. And they say, oh, I just went through the same thing. You know, let me kind of walk you through what I learned and, and you should definitely check out this car and here's why. We just want to make that experience kind of on demand and kind of leverage the power of mobile and the internet to um, allow you to have those kinds of conversations anytime, any place. Right. Yeah. And we were, we were, like we were saying, we were just using your app right before and some lady was asking about Florida, whether or not she should take her kids to places aside from Disney. So just a shout out to SJ blah, blah, blog. Don't go to Florida. <laughs> Get your kids away from there. <laughs> There's nothing else. <laughs> well, <laughs> Transitioning to a really cool city that we want to talk about for a second. You guys are in Seattle, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of really great momentum in the consumer startup space there. What's it like working in that startup community? Oh, it's great. You know, I mean, I think it's sort of, um, it's big enough that there's enough action and enough other founders that you can kind of bounce ideas off of, and we have a, a nice set of uh, venture capital firms and a, and a growing kind of roster of super angels. Um, there's also great talent from uh, Amazon and Microsoft from the engineering side. Um, so, But at the same time, it's small enough where um, you can kind of really get plugged in pretty quickly. And I, you know, I, I do think we have like a healthy underdog mentality where, you know, uh, we, we want to kind of show the world that innovation happens, you know, not just in, in Palo Alto. And so uh, it's, it's great. I mean, I've been here since 2003 and uh, have no plans to, to leave. I think it's, it's a great place to start a company. Do you think it would have been different for you guys at Yabli had you started it in a place like West Virginia? Oh, or Florida, uh, <laughs> or or Florida, West Virginia or Florida. Uh, so I guess first we have uh, Yavli members from those states and love love Florida and <laughs> West Virginia. Um, in terms of where to start a a mobile tech startup, you know I think there are certain things that you need: uh, access to talent, um, access to capital. Uh, access to other founders to uh, sort of network with and riff ideas off with. And, and so there's just a critical mass that you need. And I don't, uh, I think there aren't, uh, I, I don't think, you know, West Virginia would probably qualify. Maybe Washington, D.C. Um, and so I think that it is, though, one of those things where if you hit that critical mass, then really if you're good, you should be able to make something happen. And, and you know, I, I'm not a big believer in the, oh, well, because I'm not, you know, in uh, San Francisco, I can't be a successful founder. I, I just don't buy that, especially with AWS and uh, so many other ways to kind of build something without raising a ton of money. Um, what matters most is probably the access to talent, though. Like, if you can't get good engineers and designers and product guys and marketing guys and uh, and gals, then you're you're gonna you're gonna have a tough t tougher time. How do you foster that startup community? How do you foster it? Well, I think a lot of it, I don't know what it's like in other towns, but and it might be just because we're in Seattle, but a lot of our, our community building happens at cafes. And so there's a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one sort of catch-up intro meetings uh, at cafes all around town. And uh, I think it does start with those personal connections between entrepreneurs and introductions that come from that. Um, I think the other thing that uh, can help is that sense of empathy that we all know, we, we kind of all know what each other's are going through and we're, we're rooting for each other. Um, and I think other than that, uh, again, having that infrastructure in place from a 
financial, you know, uh, professional services, um, access to technology and talent. Those are those are things that when you put it all together, if you have enough entrepreneurially minded people, I I actually think that community just kind of just happens. There are things you can do to foster it more, like with events and things and, and blogs that kind of are the, the place that everybody stays connected. But, um, you know, ultimately, if you have enough entrepreneurial people, even if you put them, you know, on some deserted island, I think they could probably build some cool stuff. Absolutely. And now you've kept your team lean and mean, lean and mean since it was founded. And like you mentioned earlier, you have four full timers and you don't have any plans to change your philosophy. Um, so what's the biggest misconception about the lean startup philosophy? Ooh, the biggest misconception about the lean startup philosophy. People think it's a science, you know, and they treat yeah. it like that. So what have you come across? Yeah, you know, I tell you, I think one of the things that I found has been really interesting is if you read lean startup, uh, which I have, and, and it's so thought provoking, uh, especially around the idea of controlled experiments and and very sort of test driven product development, um, I do think that there is a, a a flip side to that coin, which is if you get so focused on running from experiment to experiment, it can you can kind of lose sight of the broader vision that's supposed to hold it all together, um, and so you end up potentially. Running all these experiments. I'm sorry, there's a fire engine going by. It's very, very hot here in the Seattle tech scene. Um, you, you can lose sight of your overarching vision. And so that actually happened to us, um, I don't know, maybe like a month or two ago when we looked up and we said, wait, we've been running all these experiments. But uh, I had a conversation with a former um, colleague of mine who I hadn't talked to him for a while. And he said, hey, what's the one best thing? that Yavli does better than anyone else in the whole world. And it was actually, it took me about a second. It wasn't like an instant answer because I was such in, in such experiment mode, like test this, test this, test this, that I kind of, um, in a way, put the core vision almost, uh, you know, kind of in, in the passenger seat when I think in reality it should always be in the driver's seat. And then you use experiments to try and drive towards achieving that vision but you you have to be careful that if you get so hung up on running experiments that it can be a little bit of the of the tail wagging the dog can you maybe give us an example of one of those experiments gone horribly wrong that entrepreneurs can learn from maybe you can share something from 99 with your brother or your experience at off and away yeah, so uh, Ian was uh, was previously at Off and Away. Uh, I did a, a startup with my, my brother and I nine and have been at other startups. I mean, I can even give you a more recent Yavli example where, um, you know, we were running, uh, we were at South by uh, Southwest, and a bunch of us went to this talk about how awesome it is to come up with user input methods that don't feel like work. And, um, and so one idea that came out of that sort of on the way back from that talk to another talk was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you could call Yabli and ask your question instead of having to type out a long response and give a lot of detail? And, um, you know, we kind of got really excited by it and got so focused on running that experiment that, you know, now that I look back at it, if I, if I were to answer the question of what do we want to be the world's best at, it's probably at matching you with the perfect person who's perfectly suited to answer your question, who's just like you, who just went through that before. Now, the whole call to input your question is an interesting thing, and it's interesting to run the experiment, and you can, and we did, um, but at the end of the day, you, you got to wonder like, oh, let's make sure we're running experiments that drive towards this core vision, not things, just because things are easy to test doesn't mean you should always test everything, if that makes sense. Yeah. Definitely, and it's really clear that values are very important to you, and whether you're finding values in the people that you have personal relationships or you're connecting people on Yavli, I mean, not many websites are designed to connect people based on karma. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. What do you value most in people, Tom? Uh, honesty, integrity, um, sort of the desire to kind of do the right thing. 
uh, you know, I, I think I think in a in a way you can get so caught up in the scene that your whole goal is to have like some giant exit and become like some celebrity, uh, you know, entrepreneur or investor, and you you can end up doing like maybe you can lose track of that and do unnatural things, and so one of the things that um, that I that was sort of very moving for me. Uh, there was a, a piece written by uh, Clay Christensen, a, a professor at, at Harvard Business School, who came up with the innovator's dilemma. But his piece that was kind of won a bunch of awards more recently was about sort of how you define your life. And he talked about how um, if you make certain compromises around ethics and morality, but mainly ethics, um, they may seem like small things, and then tomorrow. You do an, another one that's just a little bit bigger, and you could look up, and years later, you know, you could be, you know, like Ken Skilling, the CEO of Enron, who started out like a normal person, a really smart, for all you know, intents and purposes, probably a good person, and then he just kept making these little little things, and he became like you know on the cover of Business Week and and a star. I mean, I remember in grad school, people talking about Enron as an example of like one of the best. Alum, alums of the of the MBA program, and obviously now he's, you know, um, dis, definitely in disfavor. And so I think, uh, yeah, honesty, integrity is super important, and we look for that uh, above anything else. Actually, when we hire, we kind of feel like, well, if you get someone who's smart and honest, everything else you can fill in, for the most part. But if you don't have someone that's smart and honest, uh, you, you just you, it's uh, you just can't afford that. Now let's jump to today, where your total funding now stands at 1.3 million. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And you have investors like the former Facebook general counsel Rudy Gaudre. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Song is on there from Nike. You have Ben Ha, like you mentioned, of Cheeseburger. So I'm just curious, what's the biggest takeaway moment so far, or the words of wisdom that you've received from them? Oh, um, well, it differs. Uh, by investor, um, I would say in general, you know, I think some of the the advice I've gotten from our backers so far, um, you know, one was very practical, which is uh, raise more than you think you need, and um, I, I've just, uh, you know, we didn't, we we actually uh, now it's up to one point five, and we we didn't think we needed that because we we're kind of trying to stay lean. But um, you know, you never know how long something's going to take. It all—I mean, being in product, you know, it, it always takes longer than you expected. You can't predict what the macroeconomic factors are going to be next year, uh, when you are going to raise that next round. And so, you know, a lot of people, uh, some people had advocated, hey, you know, raise as little as you can to min minimize dilution. Um, but I—I'm I, I, a bigger fan, I think, especially now that we've been at it for over a year. I really do appreciate that we have a lot of runway to kind of figure this out, and we're not sort of just you know leaping from uh, fundraising round to fundraising round. Um, I think you know other advice that I've gotten from our um, investors are probably around you know they're just really good at at sort of keeping it real, and you know you could I remember I had lunch with uh, so Wilson Sonsini is one of our investors. And so I was having uh, lunch with the, uh, who, our attorney, from, who's also from there. And I was saying, oh, you know, this was like a, I don't know, six months ago. Or, and I was like, well, we're at this many users now, and we want to get to that many before the A round. And he's like, oh, well, how are you going to get there? And I was like, well, we've already gone from, a very, you know, from where we were last year to here, and if we just extend that line, we should be on that path. And he kind of looked at me a little skeptically in a good way. And he was like, well, going from, you know, let's call it 500 to 1,000 is going to be a, is not the same as going from 1,000 to 100,000, you know, even if you have a lot of time to do it. And, uh, you know, I think it's always helpful to get investors that, that kind of keep it real with you. And then the other thing that they've been awesome at was, is introductions. So one of our investors is, uh, is, is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist, and she's really connected with, uh, the media and, and other folks in, in kind of the, the New York scene. And she's made just a bunch of great introductions for us that we would never have gotten ever, um, you know, like even in 10 years probably. So, um, hmm? 
Uh, her name is Cheryl Wu Dunn. Uh, she's kind of really interesting. She was the first Asian American Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, her husband is also a Pulitzer Prize winner. His name is Nicholas Kristof. He writes for the New York Times. They're just a brilliant couple. And what she's a power couple. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I when we were when I was pitching her, I have to say she was the not an easy customer to convince to come on board to Yavli and, you know, had lots and lots of questions and follow up questions, but uh, ultimately uh, she decided to come in. And so we're really delighted to have her on the team. When you're pitching to different investors, Tom, you can give some advice to someone who's maybe my age, I'm 19. And when you're going to, when people are asking you all these different questions and you're trying to stay on track saying, this is my miss- mission, this is what I'm going to do. What's the greatest thing you've learned about how to represent what you're doing? Well, I think the the number one thing is you have to really deep down feel passionate about what you're building um, at a personal level. So I'll give you an example. In 99, I helped my brother with a startup and it was built for all the wrong reasons. We said, hey, VCs are really excited about this. And um, you know, let's just kind of follow this trend and position ourselves and time the market, build something that's really hot, and then we can flip it and, you know, be wealthy. And so it was like sort of the, the most uh, uninspired way to start a company. Um, it was 99 and, you know, I was young. Um, and now we've built something where it's more around like I really feel like buying and picking products that are perfect for me is currently very painful and I also feel like when it's successful it brings me joy and I want to build something that helps the world and and get more pleasure from helping people and getting help from other people and so I get up you know we've been doing this for a, you know over a year I'm still as excited if not more um, and and people feel that and they sense it and I think investors you know, they, they want to back people who are, are going to run through walls to make something successful and are inspired and, you know, maybe inspiring as well. And um, if you try and take too calculated of an approach and you just try and kind of do a spreadsheet and, and sort of say like, well, everybody's really hot on enterprise now, so I'm going to do an enterprise thing. Unless that's something you're passionate about, you're probably not going to be successful because there probably is someone who is truly passionate about enterprise stuff, and they're going to hustle and, and sort of outmaneuver you. And when the times get tough, you're not going to be able to tr- sort of tap into any energy uh, because there's nothing kind of deep down inside that's powering that. Well, I think that the passion that you have is really seen in everything that you're doing at Yabli. And one of the things is having an amazing app. Your guys' app has five stars, which is huge. And everyone loves it. We love it and use it often. Can you give us some insights about how you created an app that people can fall in love with so quickly? And it's just really, once you get on, it's easy to use and you can jump right in. Yeah, well, the app you probably are using now has uh, evolved quite a bit from when we first started. And I will tell you, I will be honest with you, when we started, you know, June of 2012, like nobody really loved it. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was a, it was a slightly different uh, approach. And so it did take a lot of iteration. And I think one of the things that we did was we just kind of looked at, we put stuff out there and we looked at what people were actually using, not what we were most excited about in brainstorming sessions. And, um, and what was aligned with our kind of mission. And it turns out that, you know, this, this ability to kind of easily ask a question, easily answer one, um, but moreover, um, form some, of, some kind of bond with people through that process. And I think that's probably one of the things that makes Yavli a little different from other Q&A apps where you really kind of get to know other people and you feel like it's not just an exchange of knowledge, but it's a, it's a connection between people. And uh, it's sort of like when you open the door for a stranger into a building and they say thank you, um, there's, there's, it just makes you happy. It kind of makes your day. And, and we, we try to make that happen every time you use Yavli. Um, so I, I can't say that I could put my finger on any one thing. I think uh, for sure we have a great team from 
you know, back end engineering, front end engineering, product and design, and we kind of really all put our heart and soul into it. And uh, you know, we don't think we think you know we can get a lot better. Uh, you know, the app is is very good, and and we want to take it to a whole new level. Um, but you know, I guess my big takeaway advice on how we've gotten the app as to the point it is now is probably lots of iterations. Um, and and lots of talking to customers, you know. Uh, we we actually we're lucky because we actually get to ask about for feedback on Yabli in Yabli, you know. So we'll post a question saying, "Hey, we're thinking of adding this new follow feature. We want to do it this way. What do you guys think?" And everybody feels really bought in, and they feel like um, it's their app as well, and they're kind of co co builders with us. And I think that's also been helpful. Now you're in charge of product, right? Yes. So, I mean, your creativity really shines through everything, whether it's your iPhone app or um, even just your idea in general. So, uh, what are you, when are you most creative, and how do you activate your creativity? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I have found that I'm most creative when I'm physically active. So, uh, after dinner when the kids are about to go to bed I usually go for a walk a neighborhood walk and I tend to have a lot of ideas when I'm just kind of walking and I'm not looking at my phone I'm not listening to music I'm just totally unplugged and um, there's something I think about how your brain works with being physically active uh, and in an open space that has helped me a lot um, and then you know sometimes I think if you're a creative person you just can't help but getting get inspiration from other things so you know as an example yesterday I was on a on an interview call uh, to be a Lyft driver not not <laughs> because I'm you know looking for the extra 20 bucks an hour but more because I just want to see how, how people are doing things and try to and, and they're not doing anything like what we're doing but um, maybe they're doing some tactic or some approach that inspires me to think about something a little differently and so um, you know I think Generally, uh, the the best ideas don't happen in the office, and they don't come out of brainstorming sessions. I do think they they might be kind of influenced by that, but I think a lot of the the really breakthrough ideas kind of just hit you out of the blue. You know, in the shower, on a walk, on the drive in, and you just have to um, you have to be open minded and maybe zoom out and 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 get inspiration from other places as well. What's one of your favorite startups to watch right now? Who do you think is the most creative? Oh, I don't know about creative, but I love, and I guess they're not a startup anymore because they got bought, but Mailbox has been a complete life changer for me. I mean, I am, I'm a guy that w was notorious for having you know hundreds of thousands of unread messages, and um, I've actually gotten to zero multiple times with Mailbox, and just that it's the swiping and the snoozing that's configurable. That's really all it is. They don't, honestly, like, they don't do a lot of things well. Like the Compose experience is, is you know, n not as good as I think as, as the Gmail app is. But the reading and the triaging is, they, they basically did one thing exceptionally well. 